Francis and I went, oh, right, that'll be so much fun. Because you get this group together and, well, tell by who's here what, <laughs> what might happen and what might be said. <laughs> uh, right, probably not. <laughs> uh, in one way or the other, the ski area, which is celebrating its 35th year, of being in operation has uh, influenced all our lives. Uh, we've all had good times, I wouldn't say bad times, but maybe not so good times. Uh, through the lean years when there wasn't snow and no snow making, we all remember that. But uh, it has influenced our lives and it's very memorable for the long memories, good times for all of us. And uh, this evening, we want it's very informal, all these series are. Feel free to ask questions. It's a fun evening. If you want something to drink, just go ahead and you know pop up and get something. If you want to leave, feel free to uh, hit the door. <laughs> and uh, first of all, we're just going to I'll introduce each one, and then we'll turn it over to them. And uh, it may get a little deep in here tonight. <laughs> For those of you who don't, this is Lottie Tweed, they own the Highlander. Uh, Ziggy Klein, he is a contractor. Pat Lamb, who owns All Seasons. Litton, who is um, <laughs> already. And, uh, Drew Judicki, who is one of the owners and general manager of the ski area. Ron, Ron Cochran, uh, who is a contractor and also works at the ski school, ski instructor. Lester Lewis, who has a uh, Red River RV park. Uh, Elsa Warno, who is retired. <laughs> John Miller, who has Enchanted Forest and uh, Miller's Crossing. J.D. Brandenburg, who is in Brandenburg Insurance and also the Red River Mining Company. And Hank Boots, who is an independent business woman. <laughs> uh, each one of these people have uh, been employed or is employed at this time at the ski area. And if you don't know these people, I would recommend that you get to know each one of them. They're very special individuals. Um, and they're dear friends of mine and everyone. Uh, Pat, I believe, has, or did. You still have Pat's heel? Is Pat's heel still? It's still there. Yes, it's still there. It's still there. I don't want to. I'm the memory. I didn't either. They call it yeah. I didn't find it. That's why didn't I didn't find it. I didn't find Pat's Hill. Oh, I think maybe it's been renamed a little bit. Oh, no, it's still Pat Hill. So, those of you who ski and know Pat's Hill, his name for Pat Hill. Uh, Tony's Twist. Yeah. Am I correct? Was it that name for Tony? Yeah. Uh, then we have one named Snapper, who is also was named for an individual that lived here in town. Uh, so, at this time, I would like to let the room give a brief. A brief. I'm good at brief. A brief history of the ski area, and then uh, we'll let you all just catch the news, okay? Cheers. Apparently back in the, in the early 40s, like in 1941, there was a, um, a rope tow constructed for a very brief period of time, according to Winnie, um, in her book. And then it was by a group out of Raton. So there was interest back then in skiing in Red River. Back in 1959, S.E. Bolton from Oklahoma City um, was here and constructed the first chairlift from the bottom uh, of town to the top summit as the summit at that time. We're up a little bit higher right now. He um, did the major development at that time. Uh, it was designed for a summer chairlift as well as a winter chairlift. It has operated summer and winter uh, ever since that, that time, 35 years ago. And um, we see that we're going to hopefully continue on that way as a summer resort as well as a winter resort. In the early 60s, a group bought it from Mr. Bolton 
and there was a number of partners in that. Um, J.B. Veal ended up as controlling stock of that through um, 1984, where uh, and when um, the group that I'm with, there's three of us in the partnership right now, purchased at that time and run it from 84 to this year, uh, 95. This is our 11th season. That's, you know, the brief history. That's all Judy would let me talk about. <laughs> Now, do you all have a little plan here, or do you want to just... Probably since you had hours worth of notes. <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, we would like to start out with some funny stories. Well, maybe I'd like to say something to start with. Is, uh, my dad was the first one to build the skier. He built the rope toe. It was made out of uh, Williams Machine Shop out of uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. And he installed it. Uh, and I guess he had a permit from the forest. Had to. Uh, and uh, there's, well, Hank, Johnny. Uh, there's several of us ski this rope to. Uh, and this was, at that time, was the world's best thing because we had to wait to get up the hill. <laughs> it was where uh, the first comma lift was. Oh, to the left. Yeah. To the left, up there uh, on the bottom. And uh, then uh, the war broke out, and uh, Dad couldn't get uh, gas to run the engine, so it sat there, and there once in a while he could take and, uh, I don't know how he got the gas, uh, but uh, he would take and get gas and, and go up there and, and start this, and all the young people around would go up there and ski. But uh, then, uh, I'll carry it just a little bit further. Uh, Whenever uh, Mr. B come in, this Stokes Bolton, he come in and uh, uh, Bolton, my dad, and a fellow named Wade Stribling, and they got together and they decided they were going to build a skier. They went to Raton, I mean Raton, they went to Colorado, and uh, when they come back, uh, Wade Stribling uh, had the Thunderbird Lodge. He backed out at that time. And then Mr. Bolton uh, got a hold of Dad, and Dad sold him the rope toe and all the permit and everything he had. Uh, in fact, I think he tried to uh, give it to him to start the skier. But there is, was the first ski area that was built in the river. Okay, uh, would anyone like to talk? Uh, I understand Buzz Bainbridge was the first. Yeah. So, would you like to? Buzz Bainbridge was hired to be the manager of the ski area. And uh, so, subsequently, that summer, he made three trips up to Aspen to lure my husband down from Aspen to take to start the ski tour in Red River. So he came down December the 7th of 59 while I was running our lodge in Aspen. And there was no snow December 7th. No snow. So this just did all kinds of other works. By December 22nd, it came. Big snowstorm. By December 23rd, they had their first students. By December 30th, they had 81 lessons a day. 
<laughs> but then, of course, after the holidays, it got real slow. But then, first Bill Bridge was the manager, and he was a great promoter. His wife was a ski instructor also, and he brought in those busloads of ski clubs from all over Texas and Oklahoma. And in a way, it was good and it wasn't good because the area was hardly developed yet. The trails were very skimpy, narrow, full of stumps. So some of those people may not have had as good a time as one could wish for them. But eventually, uh, things got more developed. Those first instructors were Tony Rondel, Jean Bainbridge, Dadu Maillet, his parents owned the lodge. He was a terrific racer. Then we had a Norwegian, Carl Sverre, he came from Aspen. We had an Admiral of the Navy and his wife, Admiral Winterholler. And we had a German friend, Jochen Point. That was all the instructors. And this was the hat they had to wear. <laughs> They could take off, that snapped off if they wanted to, that tail. <laughs> now, uh, at that time, the ski patrol was Bob Pronti and Jack Chambliss. They, they were the first ski patrollers. Did a wonderful job. The four classes started in the morning. The instructors all had to go up the mountain and foot pack those trails, because there was no cycles or whatever all these snow machines are called. Oh, they had one, I think, they used as the portal. But it was a great experience. The rates of the lift you might have seen here behind me on the wall, the lift was four dollars a day. So that was quite a deal. Well, that's the stuff that I want to throw in something. Yes. When um, when Tony came up here that first December, there were just a few of us here, not really very many. We were having our Christmas ski dinners at the Red Schoolhouse. So we invited Tony, but none of us really knew how to take it because he was tall, white debonair, had a little Swiss hat on. <laughs> It kiss your hand and click his heels and Yeah, I hear that uh, Hamilton's invited Tony to sit with him in that evening. So he called me the next day and said, the people in Red River are so much nicer than in Aspen. That <laughs> 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 was nice. Well, uh, January 16th, yeah, that first winter, that lodge burned down the Monte Vista bridge. Well, then in January 60 also, luckily, a little grocery opened in town because nobody had a place to buy a bread or loaf or get a quart of milk. That was Mr. Quo across from the Alpine, which is now six marks ski rental. <laughs> <coughs> February of 60, there was already 116 lessons on that one day. That was quite an improvement. See what else comes up. Well, I should probably let someone else talk. Meanwhile, oh, I want to throw in the the snow was so bad those first years that in. Uh, in December of '62, Professor Crick from Denver was hired to make snow. He placed five generators around Red River, 
to milk the clouds, you have my class. <laughs> And I never forget because it would snow heavily down the valley and in Aspen it was those teeny teeny flakes that don't amount to anything, no matter how many generators he put up. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had, uh, if you remember, he had a couple of pickups and they put this device in there, it looked like a big charcoal room. And he'd drive up and down, up the top of the pass, up the hill of the river, down to Cuesta, and as he go, you could see all the sparks and, and stuff coming out of this thing. And I say, I don't know whether, I don't think I ever saw any snow. No, no. He didn't have any clouds. Did, did in the chamber give him $500 or I something? I don't know like who paid for What that? year was that, Lester? Huh? Was that? You know, we did that back in the mid '60s. Yeah, yeah. Was 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 yeah. And my, yeah. And and it, 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 it was such a ridiculous thing. It was a publicity thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And every time a little cloud would appear, this guy <laughs> take off after it. Yeah. <laughs> Put his pickup trucks <laughs> <laughs> Also, uh, one of those silver eye guys. Yeah. yeah. And he had several people that had fireplaces around to throw this silver iodide into your fireplace. And, and he had, uh, there was some places down around Cuesta that he had these uh -huh. generators, whatever he called them. Well, did he tr his truck catch on fire? I think, I think one time something happened there. He was following yeah. the cloud and... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody was on the road behind him and something in his pickup got on fire and he had to get him off the road and tell him to put out his fire. He never did produce his... No. Lots of sunshine. But basically, I think, like Pat said, it was uh, uh, an advertising gimmick. Like an Indian snow day. Yeah, because you go to Albuquerque, you know, and say, uh, where are you from, Red River? Oh, you're those people who hired that crazy snowmaker. Right? <laughs> but at least they had Red River now. By the way, the, uh, the area was sold on April 2nd of 1962. After those two bad winters, Bolton wanted out of it badly. <coughs> so that was April 2nd of 62 that the ski area was sold to. Jim Donnelly and his investor cook of Texas dentists. And then uh, they had a fallout and Jim was accused of using area funds to build the Red River Inn for his lovely wife. <laughs> and uh, then they, he was kicked out for doing that. So from then on it was the dentists. I really want to talk. <laughs> well, I came here in 1963, and uh, as the winters before, I came up here uh, a couple of days before Thanksgiving, and uh, when I drove up, drove up the valley, there was no snow, no snow <laughs> so. Uh, what the heck? Why didn't they tell me there wasn't any snow? <laughs> and I came up here and we did have snow making on the uh, on the pump. And in those days, uh, snow making in Western in Western United States was, uh, uh, I think, Red River was probably the only place that had snow making in the Western United States. I mean, they had snow making back east, but uh, you know, it used to snow in the Rockies. So uh, we didn't need any snow maybe. But uh, in those days, it was almost uh, still pretty primitive. Uh, we had two runs coming, coming down from the top of the mountain. And uh, you really weren't required to do any right-hand turns. You made one left-hand turn on top, and then a series of little left-hand turns, because everything was falling away to the right. <laughs> 
everything was uh, side here, basically. <laughs> now remember what you did after skiing. And now, uh, <laughs> that was interesting. We had Sylvie Klein and Dave Perovich. They were doing the bath for us at the Alpine Lodge after skiing, and they took turns. Whoever had a date didn't have to come. <laughs> but then there were some days where they mixed up their, their scheduling, and I ended up with no bartender because both of them had dates. <laughs> <laughs> that, that never happened. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we got... Elsie used to put on the uh, hot wine for, for us uh, in the bar, and uh, either Dave or I, about five minutes before, before we ran down the road and opened up the bar and got things ready. And those days, uh, everybody, I mean, after, after skiing, uh, the Alpine was the place to be. Everybody came to the Alpine. And, uh, oh, I was, I came here to teach skiing, and uh, I ran the ski school from, uh, 1964 to 1969, and uh, Drew came up in those days from uh, Las, Las Vegas, he went to school in Highlands at Las Vegas, and uh, joined our ski school, and he's still around. <laughs> <laughs> Slow one. <laughs> so, so you uh, where did you come from? Where, you said I you was know? teaching at a Basin the year before, and uh, Colorado the year before that. And before that. And before that, uh, in California and in Canada. Never did that speaking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is to bring you up to date. Uh, Eric Windisch was hired May of 64. So he was uh, manager. He was, Dr. Veal asked, asked me if I, uh, I, after that first winter, uh, I was ready to leave, to leave here again, and uh, <laughs> Dr. Veal asked me if I uh, would be interested in building the ski tip, and I figured, well, uh, it's a summer job, better than uh, going out and looking for another job. Here's a job, so I built the ski, the first ski tip, the original ski tip, and uh, uh, then uh, Dr. Veal asked me if I knew anybody uh, that had qualifications to be a general manager, and uh, I recommended Eric, and uh, Dr. Veal went up to uh, Colorado and saw Eric and talked to him, and Eric consequently came down that, that summer and to go as general manager. I was office manager that summer. And huh? I was office manager yeah. that summer. We had a so, when, I, when I built the uh, ski tip, uh, Dr. Veal said, I'll get you some help. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was waiting, waiting, and waiting, and he said, if you need some help, just go down get those guys in the office. <laughs> Every time I went down the office, somebody was there. <laughs> they all had, had, something, had something, somewhere to go. <laughs> there was John Miller and uh, Jim Shorten, but uh, now we had, uh, we, we got it built, and uh, in the summertime, finally, uh, Dr. Veal uh, sent us a high school kid up from uh, Borger. <laughs> that, that was on the help to build a ski <laughs> Hey, John, you should tell him why you came to Red what where you were really hired to be working. So, the road. Oh, I don't recall that. <laughs> <laughs> John was hired to come up and he was, he was start at Red River, but they were really going to have him work at the new ski area, which is going to be built, oh, well, this was up, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> the Mount Wheeler. Yeah. Uh, that was the big plan, you know, Mount Wheeler development. They were going to develop that whole that area from, at the end of the whole year. Well, we had 62. It was promised it would be here by next year. Right. Oh, and, and by uh, next year. <laughs> and they told him, he said, his starting salary was going to be $800 a month. Well, that was just fabulous, you know. Ah! <laughs> we were all ready to come. And then he called me on the phone and he said, well, there's been a change. <laughs> said, it's not going to be $800 a month. And I said, well, how much is it going to be? And he said, well, 
the first paycheck is going to be three hundred dollars. <laughs> we have three kids, and we're expecting our fourth. <laughs> and Don was there already. So when President Johnson came out with his war on poverty, we were actually <laughs> we qualified. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say we had a forest ranger that summer that was, oh, it was sort of like a couple that got married after they had their child. He was a technical bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and he, we used Pot Creek fur in the tip restaurant, and the forest ranger said the specifications called for West Coast fur, <laughs> and he wanted us to tear it down. <laughs> And we, we put signs on a couple of the doors up there, one said men and the other said women. And we did not have permission to put those signs up, and he wrote us a letter called Occupancy Trespass. <laughs> and it was just one thing after another with that forest ranger. He was one of the worst rangers I've ever worked with. <laughs> well, I said that first year I was here, uh, that same ranger came up. Uh, that was between we, between Christmas, between Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving. He came up uh, and told us uh, uh, Jim Donlan was the uh, general manager at the time, and uh, he said uh, we got to close down this ski area. Uh, you can't. You don't have a ski school. You don't have enough uh, certified instructors, and the uh, our contract with the ski with the uh, Forest Service calls for you to have a ski school and you can't have a ski school because you don't have enough uh, certified instructors and so we have to close down the area. And uh, so, you know, what's, what's the deal? Uh, Gary Starbuck at the time was ski school director and he was the only uh, certified instructor certified by the uh, Southern Rocky Mountain Ski Instructors Association and uh, that was working at the area. Tony Verbal was the other one. I was a Canadian certified instructor, but they wouldn't even talk to me. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we had a meeting a few days later. Uh, the Forest Service came up and uh, represented the uh, Southern Rocky Mountain Ski Instructors Association, which was mainly uh, the Taos boys, came over and uh, uh, yeah, told us uh, basically we, can't, we couldn't us, we couldn't have, uh, couldn't open the ski area, couldn't run the ski area. And uh, so, uh, in the meantime, uh, Mr. Donlan had uh, contacted Tony, and uh, Tony was out of the ski school at the time, and he said, well, I'm, I'm an instructor, I'm certified. So we had uh, two certified instructors, so they did let us open the, uh, the ski area, continue run the ski area, and uh, we had the ski school. Then they, they said, uh, but we have, they talked to me, and they said, uh, we have to certify you before the winter is over. Uh, I said, well, if you want to have certification, <laughs> they said, well, we're going to come over in January and, uh, and uh, give you a, certifi a private certification right, out, right over here. So uh, one day in January, uh, all the Taos boys and uh, a couple of guys, a couple of guys from Santa Fe came over and uh, gave me a certification over here. <laughs> Everyone keeps talking about the snow and how late arriving it was. And oftentimes, as you know, in New Mexico, the snows, the heavier snows come in February and March. And we would get very frustrated if somebody mentioned Snapper Grinnell, who, who had the old Western Lodge. Well, in March, Snapper would get anxious to go to Kentucky. He would just close and tell all his customers there's no snow. <laughs> just close the place. We'd have some of the best snow of the season. <coughs> anyway, oh, we would get aggravated. I was first winter at the Lodge here. Boyd decided March 22nd he was closing. He never asked anyone if they had reservations. We <laughs> were so worried because then all that snow came and we had to cancel 50 reservations. Oh, um, that was hurting the pocketbook. <laughs> you know, uh, one thing, get back a little bit further in time, 
uh, the first snowmaking we had, because back in those days, uh, uh, a ski instructor was a snow shoveler, uh -huh. <laughs> a ski packer, a first aid, uh, uh, a ski fitter, <laughs> you name it. And uh, we were talking the other day, and back in those days, uh, everybody just did the job. And uh, Bolton, we didn't have any way of packing at that time, except foot pack. And uh, Bolton come up with the idea, and, and he got some plyboard and cut out big old circles. And he took yeah. slats, mm -hmm. wood slats, and he we took and screwed these wood slats all the way around the stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we took and but, uh, uh, oh yeah, it had long handles, you know, kind of like a, a surrey, you know, like for a horse. And we put wax on it, and, and we got Siggy and Gary Starbuck, I think it was. And they got it on the chairlift, and they hauled that silly thing up to the top. And like Siggy says, you come down, and you turn to the left, and you just keep turning to the left. And, they got to coming down pretty fast, and all of a sudden, the slats just started flying. <laughs> and they had them <laughs> harnessed in like a horse. <laughs> I have that on a movie somewhere, yeah. when they're skiing with those rollers. <laughs> Slow motion. They bought the a, a old Tucker snowcap. And that thing had been to Alaska probably 15, 20 times. And he brought that thing in, and boy, you know, everybody looked at it, and it looked like it just going to do everything. And uh, there was a guy named Al Cortez. And so he was going to learn to drive this thing. And they packed with it for a little bit, and I don't know where it was on the hill, but he he comes sickling off over there and just off over the hill, down in a bunch of trees, and it sat there all winter, so we couldn't get it out. Uh, so there was, uh, uh, well, let's see, I managed the area the second year, I guess it was. Buzz Bainbridge, uh, Bolton got him in, and I never did know, they never did tell me what happened, but, uh, Bolton run Buzz Bainbridge out of town. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know what happened. I know, I know that Bolton told that he thought he checked because Buzz was going to buy the area. Or something. He yeah. tore it up and he was. Yeah. He tore it up. Then he come down and said, I want you to come run this ski area. And I said, I don't know anything about running the ski area. Mm -hmm. So I was there the last of March and then the next year. Then, I don't know, I guess it's, I don't know who come in after me. Uh, uh, Jim Donnelly was running it for a while. Jim Jordan. It was Jim Jordan? First one. I don't know. Yeah, Jim, Jim Donnelly was first. Jim Donnelly. And then the area was sold, and after, they, they kicked out Jim Donnelly out of that group of investors. Then it might have been. Jim Jordan, or I don't know that from then on. Because I know, whenever Bill bought it, he and I never saw eye to eye the first time we met. And uh, so we went down and I built uh, what was it called Paddle Puff Skier. Well, it was called Easy Skier <laughs> yeah. first. And that was a, a thing that was like a sled that you sat down on had outriggers. And I bought about you know, a couple dozen of them. If you could slide from here to that chair, it did good. <laughs> <laughs> so then we went in and we built the Horty Bird area, which was there for inner tubes. And uh, then, we, like you said, we had no snow. And uh, David Willis and I had Jeeps and trainers, and we started hauling the snow. And uh, I shoveled snow clear up under Winnie's cabins, you know, two miles up the canyon. 
Then the ski area and I got in a fight going up uh, Pioneer to see who's going to get the best. <laughs> then, hey, we got a snow and they piled up snow and all these people that had like the Ponderosa, they had a great big old pile up there and I come up there one day and it says, this pile belongs to Lester Woods. And we got here, this pile belongs to the ski area. And this is how we started our snowmaking in some other country. That was rough. What year was that, Lester, that this Bill Pye company? Bill Pye Bill Pye. And my sister, my Sixty-five, I guess. And, uh, uh, Bolton, we still make snow that way up at the Enchanted Forest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bolton decided to put snowmaking in, and he uh, brought in a whole bunch of old oil field pipe and had it strung everywhere, mainly on the bump up there. And uh, uh, he bought two uh, big Ingersoll ran air compressors, built a building, everything, and well, we're going to quit that shoveling snow. And, uh, but anyway, they got it started and kind of half-assed made snow. <laughs> and uh, I come to work one morning and he had some guys in Cuesta that was going to teach them how to, they're going to be the snowmakers. And I come up here to work and they had gone to sleep and the hose, I guess, blew off, and it sat there all night long doing this. <laughs> and uh, when we got there, there was just nothing but you know, rock and mud. And ice. Ice. <laughs> and so we had... Still up. You mean me go to sleep? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Bolton said, let's you and I make it. So I take it, work at the ski area from 8 o'clock to 5 or 6 o'clock. Then go home and about 11 o'clock, he'd call and said, let's go. We'd come up, we'd make snow till about 4 o'clock and quit, go back home, sleep, and get back to 8 o'clock. And I was up at the top of the bird, we had the guns going, and I saw Mr. B down there just taking a sledgehammer, just tearing the side out of the building. There, the compressor building. I thought, what in the hell happened to him? You know, they had this sledgehammer and just tearing it out. And so I come down, and he didn't have enough air to come in for these big compressors, and they about to burn up. And so he knocked the whole side of the building out. <laughs> <laughs> First lodge burned down, the sea lodge. 68, you started with, didn't you, Jay, 68 or 69? 70. 70? Yeah. You got out of service. Yeah. And John Lewis was general manager. Drew was kind of hopping around in ski school. <laughs> <laughs> but our duties as ski patrolmen, we used to have to uh, relieve the lift operators for lunch. Oh. Ski <laughs> patrol. Uh, I did the night grooming. <laughs> I think you helped groom at night. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> double snow out of the forest in the snow. snow. <laughs> and occasionally we'd run a we'd run a uh, uh, snowmobile trip for John. <laughs> we were real slow. We do snowmobile trips. Whatever happened to come along. Uh, shortly after that, in 1970, I was in ski school, and I've been kind of tagging along with Drew ever since. You know, we found a good spot there, just hung it in. 
And then I want to tell one little story. Uh, this was when I was on ski patrol and, and grew with, with ski school. Cindy led us his car one day, and there were about five of us who went to house to ski. What was that thing, a meteor? Canadian Ford? <laughs> Canadian Ford. Uh, meteor, and it was a <laughs> kind of a panel truck. Panel truck. And the seating was, there was a seat in front, and there was a mattress and about six milk cartons in the back that could sit on. <laughs> I don't know why Drew, Drew got... He got uh, the job of driving that day, and we were going down Garf off the hill, a one-mile hill. And this thing started backfiring, backfiring. You know, and it was getting pretty loud, and pretty soon the hood was smoking. You know, it was all, well, should we stop? Should we just keep going? Pretty soon, it was a red, red vehicle about the color of his jacket. Pretty soon, it was all black in the middle. Well, we better not stop, because it might not start again. <laughs> So we kept going, you know, it, once we got off of that hill, and, you know, started climbing a little bit, quit doing it, except for the hook, I'm just going to run. We had to cross the feet all day, and after skiing, we went, and then had a few beers, and we were trying to think of, you know, what are we going to tell Siggy, you know, and I said, well, let's just name the thing, you know, and I don't know, we sat around there, and after a few beers, we somebody came up with a fire spit and loud and boom. <laughs> After dark and this morning, so you looked at that thing and said, What the hell happened to my car? Fire spitting love me. <laughs> we, we had one of yours and we used to have to stop every two miles and put soap on the gas tank. <laughs> we used to get a lot of opportunities to go to Taos and Steve. <laughs> well, that car was so good. That's the only one that ever went inside the Red River Tunnel. That's right. And it ended up a doghouse for St. Bernard. What did you do at the CIF um, in 68, 57, 68? Okay, you know what it was? 67, 68, 68. Oh, you two worked together? Oh. Well, sort of. We were together a lot, but we didn't work together. <laughs> Some of them you can't fail. <laughs> sure came, we came in 1964 and I went to work at Ski Area. Uh, first job I had was running a baby lift. I never skied in my life. <clears throat> Just before Christmas. And JD and his associates owned it at that time. Just before Christmas, they sent word down that J.B. Beal wanted to see me. Well, I didn't know who J.B. Beal was, but he sent it pretty important. And so I went up to the office, walked in, he introduced himself. We talked briefly, and he said, you're in charge of the ski rental shop. This is just before Christmas. You folks who have lived here know what the rush we have for Christmas. Uh, anyway, with his help in uh, Guys like Siggy and, and a lot of other uh, instructors and some of the other owners. Well, anyway, we got through Christmas. And I'll tell you what, when the, by the time we got through the Christmas holidays, I could do anything to a ski you could imagine. I could fix it. I could put spines and so on. Anyway, that's, that was my start. Eric Wendish was general manager. And uh, then they kind of moved me out of the rental and begin to give me other duties and uh, I remember how Eric used to drive a bike haul. We had a bike haul back and they put a put a different engine in it and a different transmission. Instead of being an automatic, it was geared like a car. <laughs> Boy Eric could tear up the side of the hill and that thing. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun and uh, did a lot of work. I cut one of the trails there one year. The one we were talking about earlier called Pat's Hill. And the area had a cable lift boat. And you folks, if you don't know what that is, instead of having a, being hydraulic, it was cable operated. So you could put no down pressure really on the blade. One steering, steering arm, the other one, the steering brake didn't work. So when I, when I got up to the top to start to make my cut down the hill, I had to get 
get it angled and set right so I could come out right at the bottom. <laughs> That's the way I cut that hill. And of course back then we had a high load, high road and low road. You could swing around, come on down to the main main uh, trail. But we had a lot of fun. Uh, Eric and I, sometimes uh, the area was looking at developing further back towards Black right Mountain. And I think there's some possibilities even now, if I understand it. But after every heavy snow, either Eric and I or Eric and Ziggy uh, normally would go back in there. And we'd go back in. Uh, they'd take us up kind of up on the upper part of the, uh, behind the main lift on the cycle. And then we'd go in with using skis and climbing stems on the skis. It was an all-day trip. You carried a lunch, you carried a flashlight, because you might not get in before dark. And uh, we'd go back to the door, the old hill, Black Mountain, uh, checking wind and the amount of snow and what it was doing to the different areas. One time, Tom Parker was with us. And we were, uh, we were way back in there, headed up kind of towards the old hill, and uh, Blizzard hit. And uh, old Tom, Nicknamed that hill up there, Blizzard Pass. Because <laughs> we were just kind of feeling our way along. We just, it was almost a line out. But uh, we had a lot of fun back in those days. We, when, the, when the lift closed, like Siggy and Nelson were talking about, ran to the Alpine, you went and uh, spend an hour or so there, you know. Uh, Eric played a lot of. Uh, what would you call it? It wasn't his... Uh, Focus. Focus, is that right? Anyway, it, it, it was a different type of music, you know. <laughs> Country and Western, and everyone kind of perked up, you know. Sometimes the, sometimes the record would get... Needle get stuck on the record, and then go over and over and over. Uh, later on, then, we uh, started our shop. I remember in the... What year did you start it at the first place? Pardon? What year did you start your shop? Oh, about 69, yes. Yeah, Tony, well. Tony lost the ski school because he decided to open up a ski shop, which was not supposed to be another ski shop in the Red River. He decided to ski <laughs> Now count him. Yeah, there you go. We, uh, <laughs> Ziggy and I, and Ron, Ron worked, he came during that time, we built a ski view. And then as the fall came along, of course, by that time Ziggy and I kind of were outcast with the area. And, but Ron was working at the area. But like a long story short, in February, we wound up building ski view. Ziggy and I went to Denver and worked. We were partners. And so he and I went to Denver and, and worked the rest of that winter. I met a guy up there, and I'd always been interested in uh, repairing skis and this, that, and the other. And uh, we got to talking about re refinishing skis, repairing. That was back when the skis had those phenolic top. You could bust the crashes out and everything. Anyway, uh, so he and I teamed up and uh, kind of formed a partnership. Uh, I contacted the head ski company and uh, told them my thoughts. And that was being, uh, instead of st sending your skis in to be repaired at the factory, we set up a mobile ski repair in a trailer. And we'd go to the shops, to the area. <clears throat> and I contacted the head ski company. And they thought it was a heck of an idea. They said, come to Reno, we'll train you. So I went to Reno, learned how to do all the things that the factory would do. And then this man and I formed a corporation for a business. And uh, Mary and I and our boys traveled that whole summer and repaired skis and everything. And so it was, it was a lot of fun, but a lot of work too. So we came back, we just did one year, and that's when we started off season. 
back then it was real slow. And I remember uh, I started with 50 pair of rental skis. And it was slow through the week. I don't know, I could spend the last few days. <laughs> and I'd go skiing. And if there was someone came to the shop that needed something, either to rent skis, Mary would hang out at a white house. So when, I, when I came over the face, I could look at the shop See if there's a white towel. If there's no white towel, I could make another run. Do you remember, Mary, that we spent in California? The year. 
Yeah. Okay. We were in California, spent that winter out there. And I was working for a ski shop and a travel agency out of San Francisco. And we were running ski tours to Sun Valley, Idaho. And every <laughs> week, well, it would be my turn to take the group up to Sun Valley. I was up there one night, and I went in a, in a bar. And I heard this guy say, Pat Lamb. I thought, who knows me from here? It was Rudy. He spoke better English than I do. He had a girl on each arm and boy. He How many of the same guy, boy? He was good and great up there. He was fun. He played the accordion. He could ski through, he could ski through the timber more faster than most people can. Down slow. He was you were when was he? Yeah. Was it? Okay. Boy, and he was over here for a couple of years. Just one. Yeah, I took him uh, that spring when he left. I took him to uh, Taos uh, to catch the Greyhound bus. He was on his way to Alaska uh -huh. by Greyhound. <laughs> but he smiled all the time. Hey. Always happy. Who are you all friends with one of the best skiers? You know? Coffee Wurzel. Thank you. Well, I have a story about Tony. When I first started skiing the Jogger, I skied the Jogger. But then I thought I was advanced and moved over to the ski area. And Tony would always, I guess, single out someone that he felt like needed help. <laughs> so there was a lift line and Tony said, Oh, we won't wait on the lift line, come on. And Tony took off a pill, skiing a pill. And you should have seen me. I thought, well, what are we doing? <laughs> we can ski better uphill. And I had a thought about skiing down. Yeah. <laughs> he went all the way to the top, going up. He was unbelievable. Tony used to take this the local kids because he loved to work with kids. And, uh, <laughs> George, George remembers this. Uh, when they would come in from school, you know, he worked on the weekend. And school days, when they'd come in from school, well, they changed clothes and met on the face, and they'd practice till dark. And no leaf going, everything walking up. Climbing up the hill, <laughs> climbing up the hill, skiing down. Tony didn't. He didn't stand at the bottom and say, do this, this. He climbed up ahead of me. It looked like a mother hen with yeah. a little duck. <laughs> 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 Our first well, actually, yeah, they made a mistake. He should have been first because he won four races out of five. But somehow they missed up the ticket, so they made him second. But uh, it was quite like a little Olympics at NASA in National NASA in Keystone. <laughs> One time they were having a it is a it is a veterans race or something. Anyway, Tony was. He was getting up in years. Uh -huh. you, you remember, I'm sure, when he was practicing after he late one evening. He practiced after the Yeah, show. And, and he got hurt, and the race was the next day, and he walked all night. No, I don't he walked, know. He walked the road to keep getting stiff. I don't remember that. Because he competed hard against Harry. You know, they were next. good competitors. You know. <laughs> but uh, he did. He walked all night. Right. So, uh, when was it when we went to the GLM method? Was it the third year or fourth year? Of what? Going to the GLM method. GLM method. Of skiing. Graduated. Yeah, no, no, no. And that's a guy named Cliff Taylor come up here. <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, I had thought of such area and I went with it, and it was, the idea was it was a three-foot ski for adults. And then you skied on that ski for a day, and then the next day you come in and you got a four-foot ski. And the next day you come in and got a five-foot ski. And then you're supposed to graduate on that. But our market, these people come in and they give a three-foot ski, and of course, 
some of these guys, you know, they're, they're tough, they're as big as a ski, you know. And so uh, the tail of the ski stuck out past the heel about that far. And they'd come in and say, get one of them big skis, them four foot. <laughs> and so we'd put them in a four foot ski. And they'd go out there and they'd come back about 30 minutes and say, let me have them little ones. <laughs> and, you know, it was odd because to see three or four hundred people skiing the mountain up there in these little bitty skis. And gosh, I don't know, it was here how long? Huh? That trend existed for several years. Yeah, it, it lasted for several years. Yeah. And uh, I'm waiting for a comeback. I still have a hundred of those. Siggy's wrong about said we wouldn't leave the office to help. You did all the chores at the ski area, including that left at Bolton Belt. Uh, had these long sleeves that held the chair cable, and every evening you had to replace the bands that held those sleeves. Yeah, because they popped off like crazy all day long. And the shivs were made out of surplus bottom part wheels, I believe. Anyhow, they were out constantly. No, that was the old red. The old red chair. Because I was up on the tower, you had to take a come along and a tripod, pull the cable off of the ship, and then change the ship. I don't know if Judy knows this, but I was up on top of the tower <laughs> working the cable off of that ship, and the come along broke, and I fell. Uh -oh. And they had these fenders that stuck out. Well, I fell down, and I hit the fender, and I bounced, and I caught the cable on the way back up. <laughs> I landed on the leaf of my body on my finger and I had a bruise from my knee to my hip. I think we let you know. What about, wasn't there an avalanche and wasn't there someone there? Oh, yeah. Oh, Scotty. And yeah, Scotty, Scotty and, 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 Tony, and Tony happened to be in the chair is going up and he saw where they got in the avalanche they were all in so he knew where they had to be. And they got them out. <coughs> Eight hours. That was on April Fool's Day. Yes, but wasn't the last hour I used underneath that hour there? Mm -hmm. Getting down now. Every landing strip is where it actually happened. Yeah. It was on landing strip. Yeah. And they just followed each other and, and uh, Scott and Lori were the last two. And um, the avalanche broke loose and covered those two. Well, Lori's head was still out, I think. And Scott was much shorter and he was covered. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, oh, it didn't take them long to dig him out. There were a lot of people up there, and everybody went out there. Through anything they could get their hands on. Yeah, we probed about, actually, about five, six, seven minutes before down. Yeah. yeah. Scotty said he knew he wasn't very too deep because he could see gray, but he made his air pocket. And he was standing up because they were talking all about avalanches and being buried to let your saliva dribble to see which way it went. So you know if you're upside down or standing up. And he was standing up. So then he stuck his arm up as much as he could. And Mary Maya was the office manager at that time, and we were running the Red River Inn, leasing the Red River Inn restaurant. And Ray gets real excited, and the boys get hurt. And Mary, my, uh, Mary uh, Maya called and said, tell Ray to get scary right away. Uh, something's happened to Scott. So we thought book of make. And Ray went up instead of me, who is the calmer one in a situation like that. I closed up the restroom, and Ray was ready, when they dug Scott out, Ray was ready to brush his glass bell, and Scott said, I wouldn't go ski. <laughs> 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 he got up for chair that you I couldn't believe it. Ray and I had apple once afterwards thinking <laughs> That was the evidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well,
Johnny. Who? Didn't you used to pull steers up with your horse also? For a while, I had to take all the saddle on steers, so I used your own coat on the bottom of the up here up to the top of the hill up here. It was one day and I got all, all the years of that. And the horse stayed out too. <laughs> Johnny was dressed like a hunter, and he was hunting a big bear that was, we were all skiing down the slope, the bear in front, and Johnny behind shooting the bear. Uh -huh. Who was the bear? <laughs> that was two people. The bear was two people. Oh. <laughs> Insulation around the, the, the uh, one end and uh, tied it with some uh, bailing wire, and then we had uh, this bucket of kerosene uh, on the support where the lift house is now. That we used to lift, uh, there used to be a couple of apartments in there and uh, a porch in front, and uh, we just uh, kept our torches, torches, uh, when we were done, stuck them back in the uh, put them out and stuck them back in the kerosene. Used to begin to actually, and he smelled like a, 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 a diesel mechanic. All these men. You always wore old clothes. The north side. And there was always from from year one they had Santa Claus coming down on Christmas Eve with his sled. That is on that first movie too of Santa Claus coming down. Kelsey, did Tony start the demonstrations? They had those three demonstrations after it was closed on, I guess, Saturday afternoon. Uh, uh-huh. They do a demonstration of the techniques they call the ski school? Well, usually of skiing, we started out with, uh, uh, like, uh, snowshoe Thompson days, and, uh, with one, with one, one pole, and we had some, like, uh, Eight foot long old skis. It's like our pants. And, and, uh, and then we just went to uh, did a demonstration that was out on the farm. And uh, we went, did a demonstration to spend through the history of skiing and then into the modern technique and uh, did some trick skiing and stuff like that. But uh, that was always a lot of fun. People really enjoyed that and those things. I ran up the hill on cross country skis and nobody ever noticed that I was riding. <laughs> <laughs> when did Linda and John talk, or Linda have her, you know, around the ski trip and she called it Mountain Mama? Uh, before they, uh, they she said that must have been in 64 after it was built. No, it was more like 71, 72. Oh, yeah, you did it? Everybody had to outdo everyone else. 
And this particular day, uh, they had built a jump at the top of the boat. I don't know what. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone would try to teach out and one of the trips. And so every, you'd have teams. And uh, you do. And everyone, oh, they were beautiful. I mean, they were really out there. This gentleman back here, on this, excuse me, it's not Dave here, John Miller. I'm telling a story. The gentlemen are not here. And I feel good about it. Come George Hatch and Gary Constein. And uh, I worked for both of those gentlemen. I don't know if they are the gentlemen. They're not here. They're not here. is that, uh, in fact, we were all out in front, and they went up, and it was their turn to come down, and we were all sitting there. And we were all saying, what is that? Because they were coming off the jump. Well, what they were doing was moving it. <laughs> 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 I mean, Picked up that guy that was drunk. 
He drank a pint of vodka or something up the top of the hill with a fusty down. And we strapped him into the toboggan. You were tail over for me. We strapped him in and made him sit up forward, looking forward, and we just left him. <laughs> From the top of the mountain to the bottom and right down the face, stopped, and this guy got out of me and went, you S-O-P. <laughs> you look so Yeah. 
Was that, did he build that before he built the skier? Uh, yeah, he started the probably in 56, scared of the building here, building there. So, did he have to train at that point? Huh? Across the street? No, he didn't that they don't. I think he just said in 62 months. He wanted a train. He left one time and he come back and he had this little miniature steam train. And now it's called uh, St. Bernard's. And it uh, run all around where the mark and uh, NB Auto, or, you know, all in two years. That was just swamp then, wasn't it? Yeah, it was just a swamp. It had some fill in it, but it was swampy and, and it had bridges, you know. You didn't take any heavy equipment in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, he'd take, that was his fun thing, was to get on that thing and blow the whistle and take all the kids around and have go on the tunnels, you know, and stuff like that. Well, I don't remember that. You don't remember that? It was something to do after he stopped the launch in the area. <laughs> well, I think he was going to build another hotel, wasn't he? Oh, yes. That what was, was that all about? He, he had just sold us his launch, and we were rather green in making contracts. So we never thought about he would give us more competition. Well, that first summer, we noticed he was starting a brand new motel on Main Street. He started with the wall, center block wall, all along Main Street. Nothing yet across or behind. And we were eating lunch, looking out, feeling very frightened by this new enterprise that would give us competition with the Alpine Lodge. And that same summer they were building the highway. So while we were eating, we looked out and there came that big highway machine, kind of at an angle, grading and filling in and grading some more. And all of a sudden that big machine started slipping, <laughs> slipping, slipping, and ran right into that cedar block wall. So that whole wall came down. And I think uh, he must decide that was a great omen. And all he did then built that little house at the end of the Dormart and never built the motel. So that a lot later was sold to Glenn Calhoun and then Glenn and Ted built the Burma and we were very happy. <laughs> 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 I'd like to mention that uh, first year, the school situation, it was the one who school house at the Molly Mine. Nine children, eight classes, one teacher. <coughs> Nine children, that was all your girls, and George, and who else, George? Was, the only one in it, the, the airport children, and someone from the mine, I think, down there. <coughs> from the and then the second year, it grew to 16 children, still all in one class. And then third year, it were 37 children with two teachers and two classrooms. So that was quite a beginning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Molly, <laughs> do you have anything else on the list? Oh, I can see Do you all have anything else you want to share? Does anybody have any questions? I, I didn't know if all everybody remembered the old list of old slide bill. The trains. Oh. <laughs> Last year's you know that story you were telling the sister. Jane Gibbs. The what? Jane Gibbs. On the 21st? Well, I felt the uh, little area down there was called, well, it's a but uh, first, 
before we had the ski area there, I built a whirly bird area. And a whirly bird area, uh, to me, is a river inner I had We put a rough book nice to see it. And we built a, a lift. It's like a, a boxcar on a train. And it hauled like about 25 people. And we had one at the top and one at the bottom run on uh, railroad track. They'd come down there and for $2 an hour, we'd get them a party bird. They'd go out and ride up and down this thing and slide down the hill. And I think, well, I still get people coming in and asking me about it. But everybody that's been around here a long time, has had a ball down there to ride these inner tubes. And uh, one time I was running it, we run it out of the building, and it was real fast. And there was a whole bunch of kids got up there and they laid down on them and held each other's legs. And they started off, and I had a, a microphone, I mean, a speakers outside. And we run it at night, and this was at night. Guy, I saw him coming down, and he just looked like a mad snake. <laughs> and I started hollering, you know, kick loose, you know, kick loose, stop, do something. <laughs> and those kids come down, and on the porch, the old powder puff, I had some one by tens down to block off the hole underneath the porch. Then we put hay, tied hay in there. And they come in, and this girl was in front. And they drove this girl through that hay, through two, one of the pens, clear up underneath the porch. <laughs> and I thought, God, am I always going to kill somebody? <laughs> and well, I run out there, and we start getting them out. And we got to hold this girl and move the boards around and pull it around. And blood was just running all over. And so I got her inside, and her daddy there and he was a doctor. He set her down, looked at it, you know, and went out, took about three or four stitches like that, put her hat on and says, boo boo boo. Well, I went, Winnie, didn't you ride it? Didn't you ride the inner tubes? The whirly birds? Did you ride the whirly birds? The inner tubes? Yeah, yeah. I know Billy, you know. Hank used to be down there all the time. I <laughs> do his head. He came down on his head after that. That's why they're having hair with you. I've seen I've seen Johnny Lewis. Where's he at? Did he leave? I've seen him ski the torch light backwards. <laughs> he did it one night. He starts like bastards. Was that on the airbag? <laughs> no, he was on the
not a question of liability, it's a question of how much. But <laughs> we called EMTs and we put a C collar on her backboard and returned her to the house. But we got her to the house and your, your neck has a natural curvature. Apparently when she hit her head on the snow, her neck muscles went into a spasm and just straightened her neck out. And it pinched the spinal cord and she was indeed paralyzed. They got to the hospital, figured out what was wrong, gave her a muscle relaxer, and she walked out. Here's Turbo. Because, like I like say, back in those days, everybody did everything. He wasn't an instructor, he was an instructor, he was everything. And one evening, or one afternoon, on the early birds, and we had quite a few skiers going. And uh, Gary says, hey, you got somebody hurt out there. And I looked up, and here's a guy out there, you know, and he's making, he's laying down, and he's jumping around. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, get that gun, let's go look at him. And I went out there, and blood was just everywhere. You know? And I looked at Gary, and I said, what the hell are we going to do with him? Gary said, I don't know. I said, let's drag him off them bushes. We'll tell him by the side. Back in those days, you didn't have after ski boots. And so everybody wore ski boots. And what happened was, anytime time you got hurt down there, you was, got hit with a ski boot. And this guy, he stopped. And he was laughing so much, and he turned around, and he looked, and here come a bunch of them come out and hit him in the nose, broke his nose, and knocked him out. Of course, that's where old blood. Uh, okay, and I, that was the first thing we thought for well, getting this bush in the house. <laughs> 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 uh, Thank you. We appreciate everyone coming tonight. We're going to have uh, about two or three more of these. Uh, the next one we hope will be in February, and it will be on the history of the mines. And we'll try to uh, do some publicity on it. And uh, if you missed our first one, it was just wonderful. And it was on just the history of Red River and some of the pioneer families that had been there you know, in the past hundred years. So uh, we'll try to get some publicity so you'll know. I, 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 it will be very, very worthwhile. And, uh, I have one comment tonight. This gentleman has not said very much tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you need to go, if you don't know him, you need to meet JB. He's probably one of the prettiest speakers. I don't see him. But he's never about. He's very special. And probably looks better up here to see things than anybody does. <laughs>